title of the message this morning, this afternoon, <laughs> is Tempted, Tempted. I'm going to begin by reading the entirety of Matthew chapter 4. Follow along with your Bible as I read Matthew chapter 4. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulon and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region of, and shadow of death light is sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan." So I'm focusing directly on the first 11 verses of this. And it was interesting that I didn't exactly focus too much because I knew my context and what I want to talk about was, was specifically temptation. You can turn to James chapter 1 if you would. James chapter 1. I'll be back in Matthew. <clears throat> but it's interesting to note that the temptation came unto Jesus. He was led up of the Spirit, the Spirit drawing him unto this same situation where he would be tempted of the devil. And it's interesting to note that as soon as this was all completed, verse 12 rolls into Jesus just getting right to work. He gets right to calling upon all of his disciples, his laborers. He gets right up to healing. And the Bible says this word all so many times. He finds all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. And his fame goes out and he has all sick people come unto him. And it was all basically brought upon from the springboard that was the temptation that Christ experienced. The temptation that he experienced launched him into the ministry that he had. James chapter 1 and verse 2, we begin to see the definition of, of temptation roll out. Specifically from the dictionary, it just means enticement, to be enticed, to be drawn onto something. And the thing you'll realize very quickly about temptation is it is something that can strengthen us it is also something that can destroy us. We can be grown spiritually because of it, or we can fall 
because of the temptations that come before us. If you look in James chapter 1 and verse 2, the Bible reads, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. So when various temptations enter into our life, we're to count it all joy. How, how come we should count it joy to be enticed, to be drawn away of something? Well, because the Bible is clear, as it says next, it says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So here we see that patience is the end goal of the temptation. Your faith being tried in all this, and we're to rejoice and be joyful when we fall into these diverse temptations. It's interesting to note that in verse 2 there's that phrase, you fall into diverse temptations, you fall into. Too often we hear people say, I fell into sin. Well, no, the Bible doesn't record anyone falling into sin. You don't, you don't just trip and fall into a bottle of alcohol. You don't just trip and fall into the, the, the wrong side of town and, and that sort of thing. You don't just trip and fall into sins. No, you fall into temptations, you choose to yield unto them, and that's where the sin lies. So yes, we do fall into temptations, but that's only the first step to where sin would eventually grab a hold of us. No, we choose to sin. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Sin is set before us as a temptation, and we choose to or we choose not to take part in that thing. So we see that in verse 3, trying, that testing, that, that proving of your own faith, it worketh patience. And patience is a virtue that Christians ought to grow in, right? Verse 4 says, let Patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So patience in her work in us is a perfecting work. It is drawing us unto completion, because that's what perfect means. It doesn't mean sinless. It doesn't mean without fault. It means complete. So patience's perfect work in us is to make us perfect. It is to make us entire. It is to make us wanting nothing. So I said at the beginning that temptation is something that can grow us and strengthen us. And the interesting thing that you'll notice is as we're reading through James here, you'll find that the area that we are most expected to grow in, and that is the fruits of the Spirit, that is the creation of what the Spirit does in us, is reflected in here. It says what? Count it all joy. It says, let yourself, in verse 4 in the beginning, it says, let patience have her perfect work. That's giving opportunity. That's passing up the ability. That's taking the onus from me and the, and the reason for me and the, the requirement for me and putting it on patience to do that work. Well, that's a step of faith. And the end of all that is that you would be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. What peace would come from the man that is now perfect, entire, and what? Lacking nothing. Wanting nothing. There's a great peace when you find yourself in that contented state. So our, already in those first three verses, we see the work of temptation um, creating in us the fruits of the Spirit. Joy, faith, peace. And there's more. Verse 12 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Well, there's long-suffering growing in somebody. When you endure the temptation... For when he is tried, he shall receive of the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that what love him. There's love then being created through the temptation, through the enduring of the temptation. It says we will receive a crown of gold. We will receive that crown that is promised. We will receive that crown that is given unto. We will receive that crown of life that is promised to them that love God. If ye love me, keep my Commandments, the Bible says. So love extended at this time is also grown in the Christian through going through and during the temptation, through going through the trials of their faith at this time. The Bible does say, if ye love me, keep my commandments. So then all of this temptation speaks to the trying of our faith. It speaks to the trying of us in obedience unto the commands that God has. And this is how temptation works, because temptation is drawing us, is enticing us to commit a sin. But the Bible says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. So that temptation is going to draw me to sin against God, but yielding away from the temptation and unto the commandments of God grows us in our own love towards him. So the temptation here grows only when we yield to it. So we can grow as Christians depending on where we choose 
to, to move and the next step once temptation comes in. If we're overcome by a temptation, obviously we are destroyed for it. But if we overcome the temptation, we grow and we administer. We already see. We, we grow and we already have about five of nine of the fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, faith, temperance. And we see here, just in those first few verses of James, joy, faith, peace, long-suffering, love, all grows in us because we put up with, because we are diligent to overcome in temptations when they come upon us. So here, as I said, we have the choice to make. And it always comes with a caveat. God, God always says to us, you know, do my will. If ye will, I will bless. If ye won't, ye will be cursed. And so he says here in verse 13, he says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Whoa, 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 James, you got it all wrong. Did you, didn't, didn't God tempt Abraham in the wilderness when he had him offer up his son Isaac? Well, yes, we, he did. But we have to pay attention to the, the verses very carefully and watch the words. It said, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So he's not tempting us with evil. He is not purposefully trying to dangle that sin before us to make us commit it. Yet the devil will do it. All God does essentially is allow for the evil that the devil is going to produce to have free course up to a limit within our life. He is not tempting us with evil, though he created evil. He is not forcing us or putting before us a, an enticement to do wrong. According to the Bible here, it says, don't say that you're tempted of God when you go through temptations. No, you cannot be tempted by God. God does not tempt anybody with evil. But here's what temptation is. In verse 14 it says, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his what? Own lust and enticed. So we don't need the devil to always just be there tempting us. The Bible is clear that our own lusts do a good enough job in and of itself. Our own lust, our own carnal nature has the ability to tempt us. And if we believe, if, if we've been involved in sins specifically in the past, I believe that the temptation towards those sins will be even higher. Somebody who's never smoked a cigarette in their life doesn't look at somebody smoking and say, man, that would be nice. But somebody who has quit that sin will potentially look in that same scenario and say, you know, I could go for one of those right now. Why? Because... We are tempted when we are drawn away of our own lust. And at some point, perhaps a certain lust that you have was a, a, a hindrance to you, was a, step, a, a stumbling block unto you. And so when you see it, it's easier for that to be drawn, you to be drawn unto that same sin. Again, God does not tempt us with evil, though he may freely allow these fiery trials to come. It is all to the end that we would grow thereby. God isn't just letting bad things happen to us, letting trials and temptations enter into our life just to watch us suffer and go through them. No, because the Bible says that he, is, he, he allows the fiery darts to come into our life because it's that same fiery dart, which is the trial, which is the temptation, which is the struggle that we go through that will refine us as silver is refined. You cannot make pure silver without fire to pass it through. And that's the same thing that God's doing with us. He's as a refiner putting us through the fire, though he doesn't do the evil himself. He's allowing for the evil to come upon us, that when we are tried, we shall come forth white. When we are tried, we shall come forth without the same dross that was upon us. The end is always the, the greater blessing and the greater benefit of any kind of trial that God puts us into. Verse 15, it continues on. It says, Every man is tempted, verse four, when he, 14, when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, so once he's been drawn, once he's been enticed by his own lust, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And so the end of this, well, yes, sometimes it would be Satan coming into your life, like we saw in Christ's life. The end of this is that if, if we're to yield not unto the blessings that God has for us and the refining that God has for us, if we're to yield unto the temptation, if we're drawn away of our own lust and enticed, the end is something that is quite bitter. It is sin. And after sin, it is death. Yes, even for the believer. They can spiritually just ruin and destroy and have death upon their lives, even while they are here on this world and even while they are here breathing. So our choice is is twofold. We can either have the joy and the blessing associated with overcoming the temptations that come into our, li our lives, or we can have sin and death, which comes from the same 
temptation, but will all depend on the choices that we make regarding it. You can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if, you're, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So we know that 2 Peter says that the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. And that's one thing that we need to count upon. We need to trust that we can overcome, we can have joy, we can have blessing, we can even grow through the temptations that are, are placed before us. And that's the end result. That is the desire that God has. That is why he would even bring these temptations into our life. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 the Bible says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to men. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So the end result, obviously, is that when temptation comes in, we're able to bear it. The, the Bible records here that God doesn't give us temptations that are beyond, above and beyond the measure that we can withstand them, that we can get through them. He will not suffer us to be tempted above that which we are able, but I like this. He always makes a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So the way of escape is going to be different in every scenario, right? You're going to, you're going to have situations where perhaps you're a man, you're, you're tempted by, by your eyes and what you see. Perhaps there's a scandally dressed lady in the grocery store. Well, the way of escape could simply be you turn and go down the next aisle, right? God's always going to bring, when temptations come into your life, an opportunity for the believer to escape such things. But he doesn't say that we're going to escape them and be free from them and we'll never be tempted ever again. No, he says these words, that ye may be able to bear it. In other words, the temptations are going to keep coming. You're going to have them on your back. You're going to be bearing them. But he's going to provide for you opportunities and ways to get through it, not giving you temptations above that which you are able to bear, but will carry you through it. So this isn't a freedom from temptation. This is a forbearing of temptation, giving you opportunities to bear these things as you're going through them. Hebrews chapter 4 records uh, Jesus as our high priest going through similar things and therefore has the opportunity to give us what we need in these scenarios. Give us the way to escape. Why? Because he lived here, he experienced what we experience, and he knows, as the Bible says in 2 Peter, he knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Why is he able? Why does he know how to deliver the godly out of temptation? Verse 15. Hebrews 4 verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. I like how the, the phrase is very specific there. He was, past tense, in all points tempted like as we are. Are. So in other words, Jesus isn't suffering the same temptations now, is he? He doesn't have the same uh, trials coming for him, uh, the same temptations for perhaps from the devil coming to him. No, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He didn't have sin reigning and ruling over him as we do as sons of Adam. He didn't have that same pressing upon him to yield unto these things. But he did experience with a certain measure, the feelings of our infirmities. He was touched, he was affected, he was influenced by the feelings of our infirmities, and as the high priest now, he's able to sympathize, he's able to provide ways out, he's able to know what we need to escape, and to bear, and to long suffer, and to in the end have peace and joy because we've overcome temptations, because he experienced and lived these same things, so he's able to help and minister unto us in these situations. It's very hard for somebody to minister unto somebody when they can't see eye to eye with them. I may not have experienced all the same sins as anybody around here, but I am flesh. And so I, as a, as a preacher, can be touched with the feelings of your infirmities. Though I may not have the same temptations you do, I can still relate to you. In the same way, Christ, he came to this earth so that he could feel the same infirmities. He could experience the same trials. He could go through the same temptations in order that he could more realistically and in a present way minister unto us. 
So we should go to him, right? And we should go to him boldly. Verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So when we're in trouble, when we're in temptations, the first thing that we ought to do is bring it before the throne of grace and just ask God to help you through that situation. Come to Christ and ask for mercy. Ask for grace. In that time of need, he will provide it according to the Bible, not according to what I say. Turn to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Prayer is one way that we can begin to get through the battle of temptations that are placed before us. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 40, Jesus said to his disciples, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And again, he said in verse 46, Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. He did not want his people to enter into temptation. He didn't want them to succumb to the temptation. And so he said, hey, if you would pray, if you would rise, if you would be watching and unto prayer in this situation, uh, there's, there's chance that you would escape the very temptation that is facing you. And so he says to them, pray, pray, seek me, pray, seek the Father, pray. Luke chapter 11 in verse 1 Christ begins to teach us how to pray. He said, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So even as Christ begins to teach his disciples of how to pray, not a pray to repeat, not something to chant as we go throughout our day, but rather a formula for praying unto the Father, he ends it off after giving glory unto the Father, after telling how holy he is, after saying, Lord, may your kingdom come, your will be done in this earth. Lord, provide for us our daily needs. Lord, forgive us our sins and myself first. We are indebted. We are forgiving in our own hearts and trying to do this thing. He says, and lead us not into temptation as a pattern of prayer that we would seek, that we wouldn't be tempted and wouldn't be tried. Specifically, I believe, above measure, right? Because temptation, again, aren't always bad things. But we're saying, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So don't lead us to where we would be repeatedly tried above that we are able. But Lord, as a pattern could you help us? And that's the pattern that we see here. There's a pattern then to pay for release and for deliverance from the temptations, even as they come unto us. Jesus knows exactly what we're going through. Mark chapter 12 and verse 15. Mark chapter 12 and verse 15. The Bible says, Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. Mark chapter 10 and verse 2. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? Mark chapter 8 and verse 11. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. Back in Mark chapter 1 and verse 13. Mark 1 13. The Bible says, And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan. And was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. And that's referring back to our original point, which will be in Matthew chapter uh, 4. We'll get there, Matthew chapter 4. Is that same temptation that Jesus is helping to minister us, minister to us through, is the same temptation that Jesus Christ faced. He faced what? The, the, 
the Pharisees and the religious zealots attacking him and trying to trip him up in his words and trying to and trying to mix up his ministry and trying to get him to say wrong things and to do wrong things. And at the same time, he also had the devil working in his life, trying to tempt him to draw him away of his own lust and entice. But we know that Jesus didn't have his own lust. So for us, we have our own lust. We can be enticed by that. We also have the devil coming at us. Jesus had the enticement that came. So he had the temptation, but his own lusts weren't coupled with it. He didn't have those lusts. So he had enticement coming from the religious zealots. He also had enticement or temptations coming from Satan, and they come in the same pattern to Christ as they came unto us. And that's the lusts of the flesh and the lusts of the eyes and the pride of life. All that is in the world, right? All of these things are used against us in this world. And we see these play out in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 11. So if we'll just walk through this passage, we can see how the temptation came and what form it took. And it's always going to be threefold. Lusts of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. is always going to be the way that we're influenced by the world around us. But watch how Jesus reacts and responds to these, and we can learn a thing or two. Verse 1, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. That seems obvious. He was, he was hungry after he had fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights. We need to look to something like this and see that was when the devil came and began to attack him. See, sometimes we will set aside a time for fasting and prayer, and we're going to say, oh, I'm going to fast and pray for three days for such and such a situation. We would keep these things private. That way our reward is something that is, that is of eternal consequence and not something that's just a reward here on earth. But we set aside three days to fast and prayer. Well, the devil doesn't enter in on day one and start to tempt us and try us to break that fast or to do wickedly or to do wrongly. No, he waits until the three days are come, and afterwards when we are hungered, that's when he would step in, even into our own life. So we need to be watchful when we're hungry, when we're tired, when we're thirsty, when we're aching, when we're drained, when we're stressed out. These are going to be the opportunities that the devil takes advantage of to come, and when we're weak in the flesh, try to attack us spiritually, just as he did to Jesus at this time. Verse 3 says this, it says, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Remember, he was hungry, and he said, here's some stones. If you're the son of God, you created these very stones. Command that they be made bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So here the temptation is to take the stones and make them bread. This is the lust of the flesh. This is the desire for man to satisfy, to gratify, to be self-sufficient, to provide for ourselves our own meats, our own sustenance, by our own works and our own labors and our own creation is the temptation put before us, the lust of the flesh. And Jesus' response to this is simply, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In other words, I have bread to eat that ye know not of, is what he is responding. He is saying that the bread that is sustaining him is that bread of life. And that's what man lives by. You can't tempt me with food, devil, because I live by a bread that is greater than all this, an eternal bread. Verse 6, And saith unto him, then the devil, sorry, verse 5, taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angel charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Here he says, cast yourself down. Here the temptation is the pride of life. He is saying, hey, take risks. He is saying, hey, God will provide. He is saying, hey, throw thyself down, and when you survive, you will be glorified as this great man who succumbed what had happened. They're not going to see the real the world around is not going to see the spiritual angels descend upon Jesus and scoop him up where he did jump from the pinnacle as the devil commanded. But they would see Jesus 
who survived such a thing, and glory would be put upon him inappropriately. The pride of life. And when the pride of life enters into our realm, we need to respond just as Jesus did. Jesus said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Don't, don't put those same temptations before the Lord. Don't, don't say, God will provide for me as he promised, so I'm not even going to get a job. I'm just going to sit here and be a lazy bum, right? God will provide for me. God will get those souls saved like the Calvinists believe. God will do such and such and such and such. And always putting the onus unto God to do great things and making yourself a lazy person or here, like Jesus was tempted to do, making, making yourself somebody that takes these great Risk. It's the pride of life that would have somebody basically just think that God's going to control every aspect of their life and, and save them out of situations without doing their part first. So here the temptation was to try God. It was to entice God. It was to, hey God, I did such and such. Would you now do such and such? Right? Asking God to essentially just, just bless and encourage. Just because his word says something, we tempt him to do the same. It's a wrong motive here. It's pride that is being tempted, Jesus is being tempted with here. And verse 8 says, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. So here he comes to this very high mountain so that he can see all the kingdoms of the world. And when he sees them, the temptation enters in. When the devil saith unto him, verse 9, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The lusts of the eyes. You can have everything. All these things is what the devil offered here in Matthew 4. He says, you can have all of these things if... You will fall down and worship with me. Everything your eyes desires, everything that you see before you, everything that is, is to be held, this world has to offer all the grandeur, all the greatness, all of the kingdoms, right? He's, he's talking about him being, him being famous, him being among the greats, him being, him being bigger, than, bigger than big and just, just famous and well-known within the whole world. And that is another temptation that we too can suffer as our eyes are enticed by the same things that the world has to offer. Fame, fortune, notoriety, all those types of things. And Jesus' response is, as ours should be, is that Satan, get thee hence, Satan. For it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. In other words, Satan, you're not going to tempt me with lifting me up to fame, to fortune, to riches, to, to notoriety. You're not going to tempt me with such things because I'm not interested in such things. The only one that deserves to be lifted up and worshipped and praised at any time is the Lord Father God, the Lord Jesus. And that's what he says. He says, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The devil put before the eyes of Christ all the kingdoms of the world, and Jesus basically said, Well, those belong unto God and God alone. He is only the one that is worthy to be worshipped. He is the only one who is worthy to receive that type of veneration. So here again we see the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. All the things of the world are the things that come at us in temptation. Isn't it interesting that the same enticement is our own lust that draws us unto it? We're worldly creatures. We were created of the dust of the earth. So our natural desire and inclination is always going to be to the things of this world. God here expects of us uh, an, uh, an affront, a uh, pushing away of, a separation from the world. And this is why temptations come in, because the world is drawing our lustful heart toward itself, and we need to, as spiritual individuals, draw ourselves unto the same God that calls us to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and I shall receive ye. It's interesting to note that as... We read through these passages of Scripture. Sometimes the devil will quote the Bible very close to what the Scriptures read. Sometimes he'll twist the words up. Sometimes he will quote it verbatim. He's always going to come out with a type of truth. It, it seems to be true what he is saying, but it's always contextually not true. This is why I always like to read the entirety of a passage of Scripture before we preach on even a portion of it, because it gives us a bigger picture of the whole. That's not something that the devil would do. The devil would come in and he would, he would find a verse, verse 19, and he saith unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. 
I'm the preacher. You shall follow me, right? I will make you preachers of men, right? The Bible does say, follow me, right? Follow me. I'm going to go drink this Kool-Aid. Follow me. The Bible says it here, clear as day, right? Right? It, it's easy to do that when you don't grab the whole context. And this is exactly how the devil works. But if you look at the context of Scripture, you're never going to be defeated by this. All the time at the door, someone wants to quote a Scripture verse to me, and I say, okay, great, let's go there. And it, it freaks them out, right? Because they know, and I know, that as soon as you go to the context, that Scripture may be, yeah, follow me. But if you look, God only shall thou fall down and worship is right in the context of the same thing. I can destroy that preaching of follow me and I will make you fish of men because the context allows for that. But what you will notice as you're reading through this and as you're studying through this is that every single time that Jesus was tempted by the devil, whether it was truth misapplied or whether it was a complete lie and forgery of the scriptures, Jesus' response was scripture. He always had a Bible verse to back up how he was going to fight against the devil, right? And that's our sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Jesus used that same sword, which receded out of his mouth to destroy his enemies. And so we need to be conscious of these things. And it makes me wonder in the day that we're living in with so many preachers basically looking at all of the Bible previous to what we're reading and kind of rejecting it and just ignoring it and not studying it. It makes me wonder you know, why they're surprised when, when their ministries are falling apart? Why are they surprised when, when, when they're not getting people saved? Why are they surprised when their marriage is, when, when their life is just falling apart and destroyed, when they're ignoring the very scriptures that Jesus used in order to fight the devil? Look at the first verse he quoted. It says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. Jesus saith unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That's Deuteronomy again, 6 and verse 16. Then Jesus saith unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 13 again. He goes to Deuteronomy, which is what? A retelling of the law. So if you want a concise version of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, you go to Deuteronomy because that's just the law retold to the people at a, at a later stage in their lives. When, when the law was presented unto them again, second law is what Deuteronomy means. And Jesus was constantly going to those very scriptures that too often we want to say, oh, those are archaic. Oh, those are written for the Jews. Oh, that's something that we don't follow anymore. And yet it was Jesus' very weapon to overcome temptation. And when he overcame temptation, he was blessed above all men. And we too can overcome temptation in the same pattern that Jesus does. Temptation enters in. It draws our flesh. We're enticed in our flesh. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life that is of the world is going to draw us unto it. We need to take verses like Deuteronomy chapters from there. We need to take verses from chapters like Leviticus, from Exodus, from Old Testament, yes. And we need to be able to quote them. We need to be able to iterate them. We need to be able to expound upon them. We need to be able to apply them to our lives. And that's something that is missing from modern day Christianity, is taking Old Testament scriptures and principles and applying them directly to our lives. And then we wonder why the temptations of the devil are resulting in sin. And when sin is finished, is bringing forth death. Anyone wondering why there's dead churches all over the place? It's because they have not heeded to the very commands of God. Where we're to take temptation, yes, and roll with the punches. Go through it. Endure it. What do we do when we're enduring temptation? Well, we're, we're growing in joy. We're growing in faith. We're growing in peace. We're growing in long-suffering. We're growing in our love one for another. And we go through temptations. But when we're in temptations, we pray unto God that he would allow for us to bear it for that time that we're needed to bear it in order that the full and complete perfect work of patience would be fulfilled in us. We take scriptures and we hurl it at the temptation that's coming before us. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. It is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. And in the end, the fruit that abounds is the very fruits of the Spirit. Why? Because that growth comes because the temptation entered in. We threw away the temptation. We got rid of it. We overcame it. We became patient. And do you know what happens when you grow in patience? The next time temptation enters in, it's not going to rock your world so much. You're a little bit stronger than you were the day before. Why? Because you've allowed for patience to have her perfect work. And her perfect work comes through the temptations and trials that we all suffer day by day by day by day by day. And you have Christ with you in this. He is that high priest that's not touched with the, that is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He's there sympathizing with you. 
strengthening you, building you up, giving you exactly what you need to get through these situations that you would bear through these situations as your high priest can even offer up sacrifices that would absolve you, that would cleanse you, should ye yield to the same sins. It's not in the Christian, it's not becoming of the Christian to yield to the temptations that come upon us. But when we do, we have that same high priest that we can come boldly before the throne of grace and ask for forgiveness and for another opportunity to overcome in a trial. Right? This is going to be your life from now on. Godly people suffer temptations, suffer tribulations, suffer persecutions. We need to take the principles that Christ taught us about to overcome these situations, and we need to apply them to our lives now. And I think one of the biggest voids that we have is, is just no knowledge of the Word of God. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, and thou shalt be no priest unto me. We need to take those kind of words seriously and understand that we don't need to be destroyed by the temptations that come to us. We need to be bold as Christ to say, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. It is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. How can you quote what is written if ye have never read? Another charge that Jesus always had. Have you not read? Have you not read? Have you not read? Have you not read? Once you've read, then you can say it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. And finally, you've come to the point where you can overcome these situations and grow when temptations enter into your life. But too many of us just fall flat. Fall into sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. You're alive, Christians. Alive, alive. My Jesus is alive, and we are alive in Christ. Reckon these things to be. Heed the warnings. Go into temptations with your sword drawn. Ready. Right? Be prepared. Watching unto these same situations. Watching unto prayer. And we can grow thereby. Like I said, five nights of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, are available to you if you would just allow temptation to work in your lives and succeed through it. Press through it.